Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gill at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Anubam Gorg, who is Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Northwestern University. His current research interests center around quantum phenomena involving the orientational degree of freedom of spin, angular momentum. Welcome, Anubam. Oh, thank you, Gil. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So I want to start with um, your seminal paper from 1985 with Anthony Leggett, uh, Nobel laureate Anthony Leggett, um, entitled Quantum Mechanics versus Macroscopic Realism. Is the flux there when nobody looks? <laughs> uh, and which you said, it is shown that in the context of an idealized macroscopic quantum coherence experiment, the predictions of quantum mechanics are incompatible with the conjunction of two general assumptions, which are de- designated macroscopic realism and non-invasive measurability at the macroscopic level. The conditions under which quantum mechanics can be tested against these assumptions in a realistic experiment are discussed in this paper. So, Anibam, I have to um, I have to say I have very little uh, knowledge of uh, quantum mechanics, um, and the very little I know about uh, about it, um, I have heard of the uh, the, the split. Um, split experiment, um, uh, light photons go and create an interference pattern behind it. And that has been a puzzling phenomenon. Uh, and I have heard of the Schrodinger's cat, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which I guess is a macroscopic system. And that has also been puzzling. So, so what exactly is macroscopic realism? So, so Gil, yeah, the, I'm glad you brought up this example of the Schrodinger cat, which is indeed something which you know, has captured uh, the general imagination, uh, and uh, the Schrodinger cat, in some sense, uh, really is the most uh, puzzling and uh, uh, sort of, from a common sense point of view, uh, unacceptable uh, part of quantum theory. Yeah, right. Yeah, because it says that. Uh, you know, basically, it says that something as macroscopic as a cat, yeah, doesn't so does not have a definite state, right? And this is kind of this is kind of the most uh, uh, the, the, this is one of the 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 foundational principles or foundational uh, concepts in quantum mechanics that physical objects do not have a definite state, yeah. And uh, so uh, what do we mean by this? Uh, so I'm sure that people have also heard of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And they know that it says that a particle cannot have uh, uh, an exact position and an exact momentum at the same time. Right. And in our classical worldview, they can. I mean, everything before quantum mechanics, all of Newtonian physics, you know, up to 1900 and Five or when it, whenever it was that 
Heisenberg wrote his very first paper, yeah. right? It says that, that there's no problem in, in uh, we, we can talk about the state of a particle and we can say where, what its position is and how fast it's traveling. And in principle, we can do that uh, with, you know, perfect precision. It doesn't, uh, if there is a limit there, it's only one of technicality, mm. not a fundamental uh, limitation in what we can do. And uh, quantum mechanics comes along and says, no, that's exact. It's exactly the opposite that you cannot measure yeah. position and the momentum of a particle at the same time, right. no matter how much you try that it's, there is actually a, f a fundamental limit on the precision with which you can measure these two things at the same time. So, um, so th that you say it is fundamental. Is it, yeah. uh, is it because when we try to measure something, whether it's position or momentum, yeah. That measure that the process of measurement essentially changes because we are we are dealing with uh, very very small systems that the process of measurement changes the state, um, or is it more fundamental than that? I don't know. I think it's very much that it's the, you know so it's it, so what has happened over the last century that's which is roughly now how long we've known we've had the modern quantum theory yeah is that. Many of the, 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 you start with one principle, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and from that, by a process of logic, you derive another conclusion, and you derive another conclusion. And each conclusion seems uh, totally bizarre uh, in of itself, right? So the, then it sort of becomes a chicken and egg thing, which one of these conclusions is more fundamental than the other? Because you can sort of follow this link of reasoning one way and the other way. And so they're all kind of, uh, it's an entire package that, uh, <laughs> that you're then forced to swallow. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I don't know if that answers your question or not, but it does. I mean, they're, they're, they're both kind of, they're, when, you, when we say it in terms of, you know, that we can't measure it, we can't know these things because there is no, because the process of measurement affects the particle yeah, that's that's all. That's more of a sort of a mechanistic explanation of of the uh, the the precision with which you can establish the state of a particle. And uh, so, you know, one can argue about whether. Well, let me put it this way: that the the framework of quantum mechanics simply does not allow you to specify the state mm. better than. Uh, in a way that would make precise all these properties. Right, right. That is irrespective of whether you tried to measure it or not, it simply does not have those properties. But of course, you know, as an operational point, what you point, what you bring up is very, very important. Hmm. That because we, that if we could not measure those properties, then we couldn't establish any property of the state anyway. Yeah. And so, so that's an important thing, right? So, as you say, uh, the idea that the process of measurement will change state is a mechanistic view, but but there is more to it. Uh, as you say, there is no state to define. There is no there is no singular state, I should say, in a, in a quantum system, if I understand it correctly. So, the, the problem has always been um, when we look around in the world, the objects that we see don't behave anything like that, right? right. right. So, so yeah. the double slit experiment, uh, as I think the audience are generally familiar with, um, that, that basically shows uh, light behaving as a wave. And then when you start to look at the photons, which slit did it go through, it starts to behave more like a particle. And we don't have that type of a duality in macroscopic systems, right? So that has always been the problem. That is the that is the whole puzzle, Gil. Yeah. That you know that if uh, that if we really believe that quantum mechanics applies to everything, right? It describes atoms, it describes molecules, and therefore it describes all of physical matter. Yeah. And you and I are made of atoms and molecules, so. Uh, even large, you know, and obviously large inanimate objects uh, like buildings and chairs and uh, entire planets are made of atoms and molecules. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so, and quantum theory does not admit any limitation in its scope. It says that it is applicable to any 
any physical system. Right. So, the, and then if you use these concepts of not being in a definite state, you can come up with Gedanken experiments that will create absurd situations like uh, like cats, which don't have a definite state. Yeah. Right. That you can cascade the the uh, the lack of definiteness up to the macroscopic level. Mm. Right. And so this is. So the title of uh, the paper that Tony and I wrote, the subtitle is The Flux There When Nobody Looks. Yeah. That was a little bit of a play on uh, on a statement which is attributed to Einstein that he was taking a walk with uh, Abraham Pais, uh, I believe, uh, one day. Yeah. And in the middle of the walk, he looked up and the moon must have been uh, visible, <laughs> yeah. shining in the sky, because he he, uh, he turned to, to Pais and he said, is the moon there when nobody looks? That yeah. you know, does it have? Does the moon exist in a definite state or not? That sort of yeah, yeah. It, and so, uh, so, so the macroscopic realism. So, uh, so the idea there is um, objects at macroscopic scale um, obviously don't seem to behave like like what what quantum mechanics um, say. So. So, so what what exactly is the theory behind it? Uh, macroscopic realism. So, macroscopic realism is really, I'm not sure. One, I would <laughs> elevate <laughs> the level of a theory. Yeah. It it really says that you know that. So the point of view was that that okay, look for atoms and uh, and photons and molecules, we've sort of given up. That uh, uh, quantum theory uh, has been tested. Uh, repeatedly, you know, millions and millions of experiments have now been done on these, on quantum systems, right. and uh, there is absolutely no doubt that it's uh, it's about as perfect a description of these systems as one could get, mm. right? And uh, and therefore, because it describes them so well, uh, we sort of have to accept that that quantum mechanics works at that microscopic level, yeah. right? Yeah. Actually, maybe I can give a very, very simple example of, of how the state of a system is not definite, right? Yeah. yeah. So this is, a, this is a, actually an easy, a relatively easy experiment that one can do. You take a, you take a source of a, something which, which, has, which decays radioactively and, and emits alpha particles, mm. right? Yeah. And then you put, a, you put a thin, very, very thin lead film in front of it or lead foil in yeah. front of a source and the Geiger counter on the other side. Mm. And you will hear the, the, the alpha particles uh, being detected in the Geiger counter at some rate. And this, if you've, if you've ever heard the Geiger counter go, it sort of sounds like, you know, it sort of sounds like noise. Yeah. So you hear sort of, and now if you put another foil, you make the thin, you make, you make the lead thing thicker, the barrier thicker, the, the noise will go down. Right. It, you, will, you will start hearing more and less and less uh, they will become more and more distinct. Yeah. And, and so what is happening is that the alpha particles are being stopped by the foil, right? right? right. They're being scattered or stopped by the foil. But the question is the following. If I, if I shoot a single alpha particle, mm. can you tell me whether it's going to be stopped or not stopped? <laughs> and the answer is you can't. Yeah. Okay, and experimentally we can establish that, that you can't do this. And you can do the same experiment with alpha particles. You can do this with photons. Uh, and, and so... It, so there's sort of experimental, this is not something that is a matter of theory. This is something that we see. Yeah. That you cannot predict the state of the system or how it will, you know, you, you started in a certain initial state and how it will, where it will end up, you cannot predict that with 100% uh, certainty. Right. So, so this uncertainty or is really built into the, is a feature of the world. I mean, it's a, and so it does not. So from that point of view, it doesn't look like you can build a theory that doesn't have these probabilistic aspects to it for alpha particles and photons and electrons, right? Mm. But for things like the moon, that's kind of too much to ask, <laughs> and so we're not willing to do that. And so, so what the, the what the macro realistic realism is just sort of a point of view that says that that somehow we don't care how. Uh, uh, macroscopic objects will de will have a definite state at all times. Mm. You know, so it's made the other analogy that I like to give is that let's suppose I toss a coin, 
and it goes and it lands in the corner of the room somewhere right yeah i can't look at the coin because it's too far away but i can tell you with 100% certainty that it is either up it's either heads or tail yeah. right that even though i don't know what the state is i know that it is definite right. okay it's in that sense that we said that the state of the macro system is definite yeah so so a macro system has a definite state and you can you can conduct non invasive measurements on a macro system but the question would be then where, where is the boundary between micro and macro systems now this is of course this is a, this is a question that everyone asks and we don't we don't have an answer to it you know so this is really uh in some sense if you like this is an experimental uh, this is a question that uh, is one of the boundaries of our knowledge also yeah. it's not just the boundary of micro versus macro but it's also a boundary of our knowledge that uh, so we can test quantum mechanics for more and more complex systems mm. right and uh uh Uh, and for everything that we've been able to test quantum mechanics so far there let's put it this way there is nothing there's no system where quantum theory has not been of it yeah so but you know in terms of how macroscopic it is they, they, they're nowhere near the level of uh, they're still very small so you know the the most so there are various definitions of people have tried to come up with mathematical uh statements that will tell you whether something is macroscopic or not microscopic and uh there are a lot of technical debates that go on about this and uh but uh um so the best the, the system with, which i think is the most macroscopic are the ones that are based on josephson junctions yeah right where uh, you know the 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 and maybe the simpler simplest example this is also the one that tony and i use in our paper is uh, is a device which is based on josephson junctions and it's called the uh, rf squid yeah radio frequency squid which is basically a loop of superconductor where the loop is the, is interrupted with a josephson junction so it's not a perfect loop but there's a sort of a break in between and that break is a josephson junction yeah and and now in this device the all the electrons they can either flow clockwise in this ring in this loop mm. or they can flow anti clockwise in this loop and this is some you know immense number of electrons and so you can end up with superpositions of these states uh, clockwise current plus anti clockwise current mm. right and uh, and this current is is big enough that that it can be measured with so you know it's it's it's, it's very very tiny yeah but it's still something that we can measure using fancy ammeters or uh, well yeah basically a fancy ammeter yeah so we can measure in the lab we can measure this current and it's sometimes clockwise sometimes anti clockwise and it can be in superposition and so and when it's flowing one way the flux the magnetic flux through the loop is pointing you know let's say uh, up through the loop and when the current is flowing the other way the flux is pointing the down down through the loop so that was the sub subtitle of the question of the paper you know is the flux there yeah the so that may, may explain to the audience what the title is about yeah so so that that's a really fascinating thing right so so we had the superposition in in the fundamental particles in photons and electrons we don't see superposition in in macro systems yes uh but the rf squid that you talked about is is an attempt uh to demonstrate superposition at a macro level yeah it, so actually the rf squid does show this superposition it does right? the superposition so 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 then uh, are we to a point i know the paper from 1985 we have a recent paper there are a lot of experiments going on so i want to jump forward are we to a point to conclude that quantum mechanics uh is uh is extensible to all systems well this is the this is we, we still don't know right because yeah. the problem is that uh, there's actually another uh, aspect to this which becomes very important and there was a paper which was uh, to my mind i have always found this paper very very impressive uh, this paper is there was work done by shudeep chakravarty mm. and simultaneously by uh, michael moore and alan bray so these uh, so two separate groups of people yeah uh 
And uh, this paper, this is done in the 1980s, and they've discovered a phenomenon which is called, which has been called dynamic localization. Okay, and what this paper says is that if if a system is if a, uh, is strongly coupled to its environment, right? Yeah. Uh, then, if it has this possibility of having of being able to live in two states. And you start it in one state, and you have this strong enough coupling, then it will never make the jump to the other state. Mm. So this is a very powerful, and I've always found this an amazing, uh, uh, amazing uh, facts that that these people just demonstrated. But the you know, but the problem with this is so this so the the question is: Are is the world always like this? That are all the macroscopic systems always strongly coupled to an environment, and that is why we never see them making this kind of quantum jump. Mm. Uh, and but you know, but the problem with this is that nobody has come up with a with a satisfactory mathematical theory where you treat this entire coupled world and then, which of course has to evolve according to quantum mechanics. And then find that sub parts of this world end up having probabilistic behaviors that are the same as that which we currently get from the, uh, you know, the current quantum theory. So this this idea that if you have a, a wave function or a state of the entire world, then pieces of that world will also look like they're obeying this independent equation, and that's not. That has never been established. So this is so there's a big gap. But it's a, but this is of course sort of a way out that people have suggested that uh, the macro world is macroscopic systems are always coupled to an environment, and that's why you never see this kind of flip flop. Yeah, this, uh, that that seems very intuitive to me. So coupled with environment, does it mean that there is information uh, that allows an observer to essentially essentially understand the state and hence uh, if there is information flow between observer uh, and an object the state is fixed and hence an object cannot really switch yeah that's exactly right that the that you know so the way you can sometimes think but the this is kind of a quantum explanation itself you know that the yeah. Uh, that one of the things that we know in quantum theory is that if you observe the state of a system, you you kind of force it to be in a certain state, right? Right. You, in that state, and and this, by the way, this postulate of what the observer does to a state is itself part of the Schrodinger cat paradox because yeah. it's that the, there are kind of two kinds of ways in which this in which a system can evolve in quantum theory. One is it can evolve without being observed, yeah. and then the other is that that if you observe it, then you collapse the state of the system, right? Right. And this this sort of state collapse is outside the the standard kind of smooth uh, way in which the the system goes about its uh, its business if you don't look at it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, but if you look at the the business by which it, so there's no theory of collapse. Yeah, but th this is actually taken as a postulate, right? Mm -hmm. And and so this idea that if you have a system coupled to an environment, then the state of the system doesn't evolve or doesn't cannot show this kind of jump. The, so people use this kind of second way of thinking about observation to interpret that, mm -hmm. and that's the following: that it's as if the environment is produce is performing sort of a continuous observation of what the state of the system is, right? Yeah, and so it never gives it a chance to to get out of the initial state. Yeah, so it sounds to me, uh, Anubam, that God does play dice here. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, she keeps it sort of uh, probabilistic uh, till uh, till the need arises to be dealt. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. And you know, I sometimes think about this. Uh, so, if I were to simulate something. No. Um, if I keep it flexible, probabilistic, till the need arises for a parameter to be definite, the cost of computation will be lower. Otherwise, I have to create a lot of precise things in the simulation. Um, does this uh, sort of <laughs> imply 
something else is going on? Well, so I am not sure I know how to answer that. Yeah. You know, the, the, I sort of come back to what I'll say that no one has a, no one has come up with a complete theory. Yeah. For how we make the transition from microscopic to macroscopic, right? And and how this sort of system plus environment can uh, can end up having a can end up evolving by. So this is a statement that I. Uh, that I heard in a that was made to me in a conversation by Murray Gulman, and uh, he said that the world observes itself. Yeah, and this is a, this is a fascinating statement, of course, but it's it's only at the level of the statement that to, it hasn't gotten down to the level of of proper physical theory, hmm. right? By which we mean something which uh, a theory which makes a definite predictions and is testable and falsifiable. So it hasn't gotten down to that level, right? right. So what we would really like is a theory that says that, okay, uh, you know, an electron is, is, uh, is microscopic and, uh, uh, and an alpha particle is microscopic and, uh, and a molecule of uh, DNA molecule is, is also microscopic. But then, you know, by the time we get down to uh, to the entire bacterium, uh, that is not microscopic because when we do experiments on the bacteria, we can see that this deviation from microscopic quantum behavior is observed. We, we, we're nowhere near. We know not. I would shouldn't say nowhere near because it's not like there's a there's a framework for studying this. The, yeah, that's really the thing that we don't really even have a framework for studying this question. Yeah. And so if you were to speculate, uh, Anubam, so if did this uh, transition from microscopic systems where we have clearly proven quantum mechanics and macroscopic systems where we don't see these effects, uh, if that is uh, that transition is really related to the number of atoms or number of fundamental particles or something like that, yeah. and it sort of exponentially increases... Yeah, this and, is that. Yeah, fascinating possibility. So Tony Leggett uh, threw out this idea uh, very, very early on that perhaps it's the complexity of the object itself yeah. that determines whether it's microscopic or macroscopic. But of course, then complexity is just another thing which is not defined, <laughs> right? Because I mean, here's the thing, right? That the, all the quantum computers, by the way, that people are making today, and uh, the ones you know that. Uh, that all the major tech companies, Google and IBM and so on, have online, where you can actually program them and uh, and write down little quantum programs. Uh, they're all based on these Josephson junctions, these superconducting mm. Josephson junctions. Which, so we're actually using the fact that each one of these junctions is behaving like a like a large atom. Yeah. And, uh, so there, and the reason for doing it with the Josephson junctions, of course, is that we can then leverage all the the technology that we have, uh, you know, from VLSI or lithography and uh, and adding and putting contacts on on electronic elements and measuring them and uh, isolating them and and uh, protecting them from you know doing all the microwave plumbing etc. That's required to yeah. uh, to make these things function. So so it's really remarkable that these these systems that we were talking about as as prototypes for macroscopic quantum phenomena are actually the ones that are being used mm. to do quantum computing. But, you know, but the question is, is the quantum, com are these quantum computers really complex systems or not? And my guess is that one would have to say that in the, in the original sense, they're not complex. Yeah. They, they sort of have that each, each system by each junction by itself is just behaving like an atom. Yeah. So what we've managed to do is we've managed to create a collection of, so let's say I have a, I have a quantum computer with 50 qubits in it. Then what I've done is I've managed to get a system of 50 atoms. Yeah. Right. And that's not, I'm not really using the, all the other sort of complex degrees of freedom within each Josephson junction. Mm. I'm only sort of making it work like an atom, which has two states or, or three states. And, and so what I'm doing is I'm producing very, very highly entangled states. Right. 
of these 50 atoms, but they're not kind of like, they haven't gotten to, the, I don't know at what level they would become macroscopically distinct. Right? Yeah, so uh, I, I wanted an album. So if you take a macroscopic object and you restrict the number of states that object could be, uh, like, like, uh, like in the junction in the quantum computer, uh, essentially you're looking at one aspect of it. Um, yes. then would we would we start to start to see this in in larger objects? Sorry, so, so, sure. so, so if you if you take a macroscopic object and you say somehow, I don't know if it is possible, somehow you can restrict the number of states that's possible for that yeah. object, right? Mm -hmm. Then would be is there a higher likelihood that we will start to observe quantum effects? Well, that is the, that is the yeah we don't know right that it's yeah. this is uh, that's really the fascinating thing that can we actually uh, yeah the short answer to your question is Gil we don't know that you know we don't yeah. know the answer that this is the, this is something that we would love to answer whether any macroscopic system we can somehow isolate some aspect of it which shows quantum mechanical behavior. I don't know the answer to that. That would be, uh, in some sense, the Josephson junction ends up being a very, very fascinating uh, thing in that it's a macroscopic system which is driven by a microscopic effect. Yeah. Josephson junction is a microscopic effect, but it, it ends up driving the macroscopic behavior of the system. And they're not there are not that many other, or actually even not, I can't think of another example where I would be able to characterize it like this. Mm. So, you know, there's, there's, so one of the things I study are these, or well, I'm not actively studying it at the moment, but I was at one time very interested in these things. There are these, there are magnetic molecules that the chemists can make. Yeah. And there is one molecule in particular which has eight iron atoms in it and large numbers of carbons and nitrogens and oxygens. And, uh, you know, it's a feat of chemistry to actually make these things. Uh, it's a very it's a complex, complex molecule. Uh, and, and this molecule is magnetic. Right. So in the sense that, you know, all the electrons in it are spinning one way. And so it behaves like a tiny, tiny mag magnet. Each electron behaves like a magnet. Mm. But this has like maybe 40 electrons in this molecule, and these 40 electrons are all these 40 electronic magnets are lined up. Yeah. Okay. And they're lined up one way. And this molecule can suddenly flip, so all 40 are lined up the other way. Mm. So this is this is also pretty amazing. This is not as amazing as the Josephson junction, but this is also something people ask me, how does this happen? Yeah. And I say, I don't know. You know, this is. This is the magic of quantum mechanics. It's part of a framework of quantum theory. And the remarkable thing is that in this molecule, we actually see this behavior, that it's uh, all 40 micro magnets, not even micro, they are picomagnets. Yeah. They're aligned one way and then they're next, you know, uh, after a while they're all aligned the other way. So the state of this molecule, the magnetic state of this molecule flips back and forth just like that of the squid, the RF squid. Yeah, so that might allow some computational capabilities. Yeah, so people talk a lot about this, you know, so every time people discover, so the, for these magnetic molecules also, people <clears throat> keep raising the possibility that these might work as computational elements. The difficulty with all of, with every one of them is that, you know, when you make an actual practical quantum computer, you need to read and write. Mm. Need to rewrite uh, process, and for molecules, that the smaller the object is, that becomes hard. Yeah. Right. So this is actually paradoxical that to do quantum mechanics, the system has to be uncoupled from its environments, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the that's the dynamic localization that Shudip and uh, uh, Bray and Moore uh, discovered. Yeah. So you don't want to couple the system to environment, but if you want to use it as a quantum computer, as a practical quantum computer. You need to couple to it to sort of apply pulses to it and to be able to measure its state. So at the same time, it has to be decoupled and coupled, which is which is really a remarkable thing. <laughs> you can that you have to couple to it in exactly the right way that doesn't kind of destroy the quantum mechanical behavior of the interesting aspects uh, of these junctions. 
Yeah, but it sounds like it is it is possible, right? So this Josephson uh, junction that you talked about, the R of squared, uh, and some of the other experiments going on, it seems like it, it is it is at least conceivable. Sorry, what, uh, what is it conceivable that we can actually make that happen? Which is, yeah, it is uncoupled in a state that it it has quantum mechanical properties. Yeah, but then you can use it in some practical way, like. Uh, yeah, no, it's absolutely right that you know it has this whole quantum uh, the computer uh, uh, thrust yeah. has really changed the way we think about information. It has really changed that. That I think is the greatest uh, thing that has come out of the quantum computational uh, effort so far. Yeah, which is now you know to, today I I guess this is the twenty fifth anniversary. I don't know the exact 25th anniversary of the discovery of Shor's algorithm. Hmm. 1996, I think it was, or 95. Yeah. So we're, yeah, it's it has really changed the way we think about information. Yeah, and 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 the beauty of quantum computers, if you're successful in making it really practical, yeah, that it has applications everywhere. Every industry you can think of. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that I I know less about the uh, this. So I sadly allowed myself to fall off this uh, <laughs> this train because uh, when I was done with my postdoc and uh, I came to Northwestern, I was eager to do something else. So I I, I sort of I'm, I'm I've culturally been very interested in quantum computing and I keep up with it. Yeah. But uh, I don't I have less of a sense of what the applications are that you can actually do because uh, the applications to all the different industries that you mentioned. Yeah, and I know that Northwestern, there is a lot of research going on on the material side um, and then how materials could uh, could actually push forward the, the idea of quantum computing as well. We'll, we'll, take a, we'll take a quick break, Anubam. When we come back, we'll talk about your more recent paper. Okay. All right. Thanks. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we're back. Uh, Anubam, uh, we were talking about macro realism. Um, yes. Why uh, we find um, objects, macro objects, not behaving like uh, quantum uh, objects or micro, really small things in the quantum mechanical world? Um, and what what is the difference? What is the boundary between micro and the macro? Uh, and how do we how do we sort of explain uh, the, this this type of phenomena? Um, there's, you have another paper on the same subject, um, macro-realistic inequality. It's called the Leggett-Gorg inequality uh, with, with Tony Leggett and you uh, worked together at University of Illinois uh, some time ago. Uh, so what exactly is the Leggett-Gorg inequality? Oh, okay. Well, so I let's see if we can uh, make it a little bit... So... Uh, I, I do not know if, uh, if, so maybe your audience has heard about the Bell inequality because that is also, that's very, very famous. It's a, it's a marvelous argument by J.S. Bell, uh, which he think, I think he wrote it in 1964. Yeah. And uh, uh, so this is really the, the argument uh, that it addresses uh, quantum entanglement. Mm. Okay, and uh, uh, and uh, so the, the I guess maybe so I don't know if, how far back I should go in terms of providing background. But uh, maybe feel free, feel free. <laughs> okay, so there was a paper. So this uh, goes back to something done by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. Huh. Uh, they wrote a paper in 1935 in the Physical Review whose title is, Can Quantum Mechanical Description of Physical Reality Be Considered Complete? Mm. Right? Mm. 
And uh, Niels Bohr replied to this paper in the physical review with exactly the same title. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And uh, I think Bohr's, uh, Bohr's paper is quite hard to understand. Yeah. Uh, but what the EPR, the einstein podolsky rosen paper does is it says that, that if, you know, if you take two electrons and you, you start them in a state where they are correlated, yeah. where they, where the sort of the state of one and the state of the other, they're tied together. And then you, you make these electrons fly apart in opposite directions. Mm. And you make a measurement of one of the electrons. Uh, because their states were were entangled or tied together, you have you have now made this. Uh, and when you make when you measure one of the electrons, the state of that electron becomes definite. You you know something about that one. Yeah. But then as a result, because of this tying together, you now know the properties of the other electron also. Mm. Right. And to Einstein and his collaborators, this was not acceptable. <laughs> they said that these two systems are are separated. And how can information be can go from one system to the other system, yeah. which is far away, and it is simply not possible. And and uh, so there must have been uh, <clears throat> the, there is that the, the full theory of the world will uh, allow for this uh, process to happen. And when it, when we have the full theory, then we will understand how by making the measurement on one system that it that we won't pose the question the other in this way that it won't have this bizarre character to it mm. right mm. and so that was why they said that the quantum theory you know it's okay it's great it explains the, the spectrum of of uh, the calcium atom and it explains why water has these mechanical these molecular properties and so on but it cannot be the complete description of the entire world. It cannot, the full theory of the world has to be something beyond quantum theory. And that's why the title of the paper was, can, the, can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete? <laughs> and so this is, this is the EPR paper. And then Bell comes along in 1964, and he points out that if you indeed allow for any kind of hidden variable, or some additional information that will somehow say that this that the system knew all along that the electrons knew all along yeah. what the properties were that they were going to reveal to the observer, then you can you can make a prediction about a certain kind of correlation set of correlation measurements yeah. based on that uh, assumption, and you can then go into the lab and you can test these correlations and you can see if this prediction is, is true or not. Mm. And the beauty of Bell's argument is that it is very, very simple. You know, it's, it's, the mathematics is far simpler than anything else you do in, than almost anything you do in physics. Yeah. Right? And so because the argument is so simple, it's very powerful. And of course, when we do the experiment, you find that the, that the, that the condition that, uh, that comes out that says that uh, that these hidden variables dictate what is going on with the electrons, that condition is violated. And that condition is in the form of an inequality. Mm. It's not an equation, rather it's an inequality. It says that a certain number of, a certain combination of these correlations of these electrons has to be less than one. And then when you measure it, you find it's bigger than one. Mm. So what, what Tony and I did is we, we, we have the same math, but we apply it to a different kind of a, uh, uh, a different. Uh, our position is not one where we we assume that systems are uh, that two the system of two parts is correlated or uncorrelated. Yeah. But rather we 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 say that the uh, th that the system is macroscopic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And if it is macroscopic, then it has then the state of the system changes and and the state of the system changes with time. And, and what we come up with is a correlation of the properties of the system at one time and another time. That if I look at the, that correlation, mm. then the same math that Bell used, we were able to use the same math to apply it to this kind of uh, uh, philosophical position. So our inequality doesn't derive its force from the fact that the particles are separated. 
right? Yeah. That's that's Bell's inequality. Our inequality derives its force from the fact that the that the system is macroscopic, right? So, so it's so it's testing a different set of uh, <clears throat> different set of assumptions. Yeah. But nevertheless, our set, this set of assumptions also explicitly rejects quantum mechanics. Okay. Yeah. Just like those assumptions also say that we're going to assume that quantum theory is not true, that these hidden variables exist and all that, and then work out what the consequences of that set of assumptions is. And then it's up to the experimentalists to go out and you know measure whether these things and see whether the the assumptions are tenable or not tenable. And so that's what we did. And so let me see if I understand it, um, Anubam. So in the Bell's inequality, it's about entanglement uh, of fundamental particles. And if they're spatially separated, um, that, that is when it, it really, really works, right? Yes. Uh, right. In your case, it's, it's sort of um, across time. It's across time. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And so, so again, it's an inequality in, in a similar sense. And if you prove it, if you disprove it, then you're essentially disproving quantum mechanics. So no, no, the, the inequality is based on saying that quantum mechanics is not correct. Not correct. Okay. It's a prediction of, of the assumption that quantum mechanics is, uh, is not correct in a certain way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, now, you know, and when you, so now the, the, the thing, of course, is that supposing people had made the experiments mm. and you had found that that uh, that the inequality was satisfied, yeah, right. You would. I don't think you would be able to say that quantum mechanics has been proven wrong. Mm. All you can say is that the the assumptions that it's consistent with the assumptions that the quantum mechanics is not correct because it's it's an inequality. It's not an equality. But of course, when we measure, when we go in the lab and we make measurements, we find the inequality is violated, mm. right? Yeah. And so that means that the assumptions on which it were ba it was based cannot be correct. Yeah. So the assumption that quantum mechanics is not correct is not supported. That we cannot, that macroscopic realism is actually not the state of, is not the way the world behaves. Right. That's, that's what the experiments are showing, but of course, you know, this gets back to the point that you asked earlier. Yeah. Are the system, are the experiments being done on a sufficiently macroscopic system or not? Right. 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 Uh, so, you know, at the level of the moon, we don't really know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, so you have other experiments described in this paper. Um, you call it a DC squid based device. Is that different from uh, what you used a long time ago? Yeah, that's a slightly different squid than an RF squid. Yeah. Okay. But but the idea here is similar. That uh, the idea is very much similar. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a two junction squid rather than a single junction squid, and so you know when you talk to physicists, you my fellow physicists when I talk to them, I have to be careful to distinguish between <laughs> the RF squid and the DC squid because uh, the people who work with these they they think of them as Different devices, yeah, yeah, and so 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 where are we? Um, so based on some of these experiments, um, um, I'm just trying to uh, sort of at a very high level. Um, obviously, uh, when we look at macro systems, we don't observe quantum mechanical properties typically, but do these experiments at at slightly bigger systems? that appear to exhibit quantum mechanical properties, do, does that tell us that quantum mechanics is, is fundamental to our systems or we are too far away from it yet? I think both answers are correct. I mean, that, you know, quantum, that you can, it's completely possible at the moment to adopt both positions. Everything, <laughs> all the experiments that we've done so far say that quantum mechanics is applicable to all systems, yeah. right? But, uh, uh, and at the same time, we don't know whether it breaks down for something that's sufficiently macroscopic or complex, or if there is some larger theory of which quantum theory is kind of a, to which quantum theory is an approximation or a subset of that, or a sub-theory of that larger theory. 
these are all kind of you know so the situation is a little bit like before what it was around 1900 yeah. right that we have experiments that sort of indicate that classical behavior that classical physics is not correct yeah. right yeah but classical mechanics by itself or at least newtonian mechanics let's let's leave out electricity and magnetism electricity and magnetism had problems mm. but if we just leave out new if we just take newtonian mechanics by itself that theory in itself is 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 perfectly self contained right. right and the theory gives you no hint that something is wrong with it <laughs> right so you can't ask the theory you know you can't look at the theory itself and and ask is there a larger theory of which this is a part of to which this is an approximation right right and so we we might be in a situation like that today that the quantum theory by itself does not really have well actually quantum theory has it has these problems this 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 measurement paradox the of the schrodinger cat yeah that you know the measurement paradox really is that we don't know what the measurement is what distinguishes a measurement from just two quantum mechanical objects talking to one another and and interacting with one another there's this that's there's no full there's no quantum theory of the measurement process itself yeah uh, it feels to me uh, anybam that if quantum mechanics did not come through uh, by now we would have assumed that we know everything <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I don't think one ever reaches that stage. You know, this is a, a lot of people have made that prediction in the past, and they have come to grief when they have said that, right? <laughs> yeah. So you know, for for a non-physicist like me, um, going back to the double slit experiment, going back to quantum mechanics, you know, the Copenhagen interpretation or the many worlds interpretation, both of them seem sort of um, sort of thrown out there without. any any real meat behind it the copenhagen interpretation and and, and the many worlds interpretation both um, okay many worlds the... i don't yeah many worlds to me is not really an interpretation uh, <laughs> okay i don't think it it doesn't explain anything it yeah. uh, uh copenhagen on the other hand is an interpretation but it's it it requires you to uh it has this kind of a this sharp cut in there that it has this two kinds of quantum two kinds of evolution measurement and non measurement and uh what but it has but it is unsatisfactory in the sense that it does not give you a good answer as to what is a measurement yeah when exactly i have two hydrogen atoms they come and they collide with one another and they go about their way we don't think of that as a measurement right but now i look at the hydrogen atom and with i i i measure its position with with the with a laser beam or you know i a, uh i detect it in some uh, with some sensor and that i think of as a measurement even though if i sort of break down what the atom is doing it's interacting all the time it's just you know coming next to one atom and next to the other atom and so on it's not doing something the, that i cannot think about in terms of atomic processes mm. right? so but nevertheless what is this so copenhagen has that issue associated with it and so people don't like it they have tried to come up with other interpretations uh, but i don't think any of the interpretations have really gotten around the the fundamental philosophical problem yeah and and the idea that the waveform collapses <laughs> uh it is sort of sound you know without knowing anything about it sort of sound sounds like a statement mm. rather than rather than you know a, a theory of any sort it, right it has to be taken as a fundamental as a postulate yeah it has to be taken as a postulate but it's a very it's a very unsatisfactory postulate yeah yeah right. let's put it that that way so in some sense uh, for us to advance our uh, theoretical understanding of quantum mechanics i think this is a very profitable avenue right so we have to be able to extend it into macroscopic systems and if we are able to do that then we will potentially have a better insight into it yeah that is one line and i think the other line is the one that is coming from quantum information our understanding of what is information uh, yeah 
you know that is that's really i think that's fascinating uh i uh, i cannot imagine that the founders of the subject uh, if they were to come back and look at it again they would have any idea that this that, that, <laughs> they, they, and if they were honest they would say that no we we had no idea that this is what quantum mechanics also uh, implies right that yeah. that really you know info we we really want to start thinking about information as a physical concept and not just as an abstract mathematical or mental concept right 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 uh, as if it is mathematical and conceptual it gives many degrees of freedom and uh, and because of that we won't be able to stop yeah but it's a, it's a physical concept it really is that you know that a computation itself is a physical process right it's not entirely it's not only a mathematical process yeah yeah and so so in conclusion uh, i nibam if you if you look forward let's say 5 10 years um where do you where do you think we will be just uh, just speculating oh, uh, this is dangerous crystal ball <laughs> <laughs> no i have no that would be very hard to say this is a, yeah. a very tough, you know difficult to uh, to predict i think uh, yeah. and you know very dangerous i think the, the i keep coming back to quantum computers that's sort of the most uh, happening thing in the quantum world right now uh there are of course things happening you know in particle physics and and so on and you may have heard this was in the news uh, over the last couple of days that they have measured something about the muon which does not agree with our current understanding of of the laws of physics but yeah. that is different from that's kind of a different boundary of our knowledge than this boundary you know i, I referred to boundaries of knowledge and the boundary of whether quantum mechanics extends to everything else is a totally fascinating and new boundary and i don't think the, the in the in the popular public conception people sort of understand the boundary having to do with with particles with you know going to very very small sizes and looking at at fundamental particles they we also sort of understand the boundary associated with looking out into space you know, and, yes. uh, and astronomy in the universe going out and looking how far away what is the property of space very far away and also back at in time you know the big bang what happened before the first 3 seconds or the first 3 milliseconds or but now even yeah. before that right uh so the, so those boundaries are kind of that they're, they're out there in the public conception but this is yet this is also a boundary of our knowledge and i think it's 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 to my mind it's just as deep and profound or or as not deep and profound but what's the correct word it's just as important and uh, and really a uh, significant boundary as those as those other boundaries that is does yeah. quantum theory itself extend to to everything or not right and yeah. is there a wave function of the universe that's this is i don't know the answer to it yeah it seems to me anubam that both uh, both quantum mechanics and cosmology uh, i think we are reaching a regime where experimentation uh, seem to take a take a higher level of importance always i think that's always true the, the theory by itself is is very hard to uh, to do and the experiment has to tell us whether something is whether what the world is really like right yeah. we cannot do, do, figure out what the world is really like just by pure force of reason i don't think that's ever happened yeah yeah excellent yeah this has been great anubam thanks so much for spending time with me gil yeah i have to thank you for the opportunity to to do this and i i enjoyed myself enormously talking to you as well yeah thanks so much yeah okay thank you bye yeah bye bye This is a scientific sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info@scientificsense.com.